Welcome everyone. Good morning from Vienna. This is 11 o'clock in Vienna. Wherever you are, we wish you all a superb day because we're going to have a wonderful one hour now. Next, in the next one hour. Welcome to our side event. This is a side event at the World Food Forum. Um, and the event is brought to you by the FAO and the IAEA, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations and the International Atomic Energy Agency. And what do we have for you in the next one hour? Uh, we have some interesting lab stuff coming your way and the lab experts joining us here for the chat. So please monitor the chat, pose your questions as we go along. We don't have much time, it's only an hour. My name is Ihan Evdansed. I'm working here at the IAEA in Vienna as a communication expert, and I'm uh, joined by my colleagues, Sinead Harvey and Eleonora Kolzani. And later I will also introduce you to our uh, lab experts. We will talk to you about plant breeding and sterile insect technique. How do they affect our life? How do they help us tackle the world hunger? And how do they really help the climate change? So there are so many interesting aspects that we will talk about. And the World Food Forum is a good opportunity for us to bring these into limelight. How on earth nuclear technologies are used in these topics. So for this, to bring you closer to the science, we went last week to our laboratories just outside Vienna, about 35 minutes outside Vienna. We have a laboratory complex in Cyberstoff. And the Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, and the IAEA run these labs together. We work on very different scientific uh, areas, but we will highlight two of them only to you today. And you will see those in the video that comes up very soon. We have two short sessions of seven minutes for each lab. One is about set flies, one is about plant breeding, and how we use nuclear science in bringing us closer to the sustainable development goals. So let's take it now for the video. Stay with us and don't forget, pose your questions in the chat. Later we will come back together. Good morning, welcome to the FAO IEA Insect Pest Control Laboratory. My name is uh, Mark Raisin and I'm the head of this uh, laboratory. Maybe you're not aware, but uh, every year this world is spreading uh, insecticides over the planet worth 60 to 80 billion dollars. That is a lot uh, of insecticides uh, and this is obviously very, very bad for the environment. It's very bad for the farmer who has to do the spraying and it is very, very bad for the consumer because there will always be residues um, you know, at the crop. Therefore, there is a tremendous demand for insect pest control tactics that are not only friendly or neutral to the environment, but also very, very effective. And this is the technology that we are working on. It's called the sterile insect technique. Its principle is very simple. You bring the insect that you would like to control, you bring it into the laboratory, you rear it in very, very large numbers, you sterilize using ionizing radiation the male sex. You release those male insects in the target area where they will mate with the virgin females and there will then be no offspring. So basically it's a type of bird control uh, of, of insects. Uh, this is the type of work that we are doing in this lab. And let me introduce you to Chantelle de Beer, who is the head of the livestock pest group. And she will explain to you some of the experimental work that we are doing here. Very welcome at our field cage mating experiment. Uh, let's go inside and then I will show you how the experiment is done. Now we are inside our experiment. So this is a field cage. Um, it's a semi field cage. And we ha I have already released the females in here. So if you look around, you will be able to see uh, the female taking flies inside the cage. So we release them inside the cage a little bit before the males so that they can be happy and um, be ha ready for the males to be received. So we have the females in here 
Um, and now we will be releasing our males. We have three types of males. I've marked them yellow, red, and blue. The yellow males are males that have been irradiated with gamma rays. The red males are the males that have been irradiated with X-rays. And the blue males have had no irradiation. The purpose of the experiment is to see how these males compete for the females inside uh, the cage. So let's open them up and see what they do. So we'll open the, the cages like this so that they can go outside. We will give them a little shake and they will go outside. So this is a very interesting part of my work. I like being inside the field cage with, with the insects and seeing what they do. We shake them and they will go all the way outside so you can see them around. Okay. So you can see them on, on the side of the cage. Um, if you look closely, you can see some of them have uh, blue dots on them, and some of them have yellow dots on them, and some of them have red dots on them. So now they need to find our females. So they are all here um, and around here. So we have to wait a little bit so that they can find our females. Um, at the moment, when we look around, I don't see any, any mating pairs at the moment. So we just have to give them a while to find the females. So while we're waiting for them to, to mate, let me tell you a little bit about why they are a pest. Um, Sesi flies are only located in Africa, so it's an African uh, species. They are vectors of a small uh, parasite uh, that you can find in, in cattle blood or, or human blood, um, and they are a pest. They will give the disease, this disease to the animals, and this will be very bad for the farmer because the animals will get sick and they won't be able to produce lots of, of milk. Um, they will also not be nice and fat to be, to be eaten. And this is a good, this is why we try to, to control uh, these, these insects. The life cycle is very unique, like I will show you later. Um, so SIT is a very nice uh, thing to be using them as birth control because one female will only produce six offspring in her lifetime. So let's go and see if we can find a mating pair. So here we have our first mating pair. Uh, you can see the, the male is on top of the female. The male is from the yellow, is from the yellow group. Um, and they will, the male will find the female. Uh, they will attach. They will start mating. And this mating process can take three hours. Afterwards, the male will give sperm to the female. The female will store the sperm inside her body, where she will then fertilize her offspring. So now let's, let's collect the pair. So we will collect the pair and we will keep it. So we will take the time of when they started mating and we will also record the time that they took to mate. So we will collect it in our, in our specialized collecting tube and then it will go inside a little tube like this. So we put it inside like this, like this, and then we will keep it and record the time, uh, how long they take to mate. So normally the experiment will take three hours. So we'll put the females in and then these three uh, test males, we will be inside the cage uh, for the entire time frame. We will record it for three hours, all the, the, the pairs we will collect. And then we will record how many of one group, how many of the yellows made it, how many of the orange, of the red mates made it, and how many of the blue mates made it. We will also record, because we have 45 females in here, we will also record how many of these females made it. So we want them all to mate. Then at the end of the experiment, we can determine uh, the radiation that we gave them. You know, remember, we gave them gamma rays or X-rays, which of the radiation uh, affected their ability to mate uh, the most and which affected it the, least, the least. And then if we have this information, we know what type of radiation to give them if we're going to release them, uh, when we release them in the field for, for the SIT campaign. So after we've done this experiment, uh, we will catch all the flies back and they will be uh, included back into the colony. As we are now done in our experiment, let's go see the feeding process. Very welcome to my feeding room. This is where we feed our colony flies. They are fed on these artificial membrane systems um, so that we don't have to use animals. The membrane is made of a silicon membrane 
chicken brain and we put the cow blood underneath. The cow, the blood is collected from cows, uh, we shake it and then it stays in this liquid form. So the flies are inside these cages, um, you can see them inside there. So they need to put their mouth through the cages, um, through the membrane and suck up the blood with their straw-like mouth parts. We give them the opportunity to feed for 10 minutes. Uh, after that, they are nice and fat and full of blood. Uh, we will keep them then for us to produce for us um, offspring. I have an example of their offspring. They are very unique flies. They do not lay eggs, but they will, the female will become pregnant with the larvae. Um, this is the larvae, so you can see them wiggling around. Those are the ones that have just been born. Um, they will become darker and they will be black, and then they will be like this for a month, and then we will have new flies. Thank you so much for visiting us at Stacey Colonies, and stick around for more questions later on about our work. Thank you. Hello, welcome. We are here standing in the experimental field of the joint FAO IAEA Center for Nuclear Applications in Food and Agriculture. Our research works with the improvement of plants, all kinds of plant species. Right behind us is a crop called sorghum, which is also known as the poor man's crop uh, in the developing nations of uh, Asia and Africa. So our job with plant breeding, the science of plant breeding, is to be improving the genetic potential of the plant through a variety of mechanisms and enabling those plants to be performing better, to give higher yield, better quality of the produce, and also resilience against um, shocks, um, stresses, such as that comes from climate change, you know, high heat temperatures would reduce the crop yield, pests and diseases that come out of the bloom that can also reduce the yield of the crop. And that is a big hit to the farmer's produce and in subsistence farming conditions, which is smallholder agriculture that prevails in uh, the developing countries of the world, where the produce goes mainly to um, satisfy the hunger of the family. And it's the rest of it that goes into um, into the market. So it caters to both food security, nutrition security, and to the income of the farmers. So to pre prevent the loss of a crop is significant. So the technologies that we use are normally to improve these characteristics of the plants. Traditionally, plant breeding takes a long period of time where the genetics of the plant or the DNA evolves over the time in order to improve over the evolutionary period. We do irradiation of the seeds of plants to change their genetics in such a way that we can select for better plants that can be cultivated by the farmers. And like I said, these better plants can be anywhere from higher yields to better resilience. And now the technologies that are coming in big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, genomics, DNA, um, sequencing across the entire genome of an organism, all of this comes together to help us develop a new crop variety in a much shorter time that can then reach the farmers and they can cultivate it and that can go towards the food security locally nationally, regionally, and even towards import, um, export income from uh, for the countries. So this is the science of plant breeding and the high-end technologies that are improving the science and on a day-by-day -day basis, is something that my colleague Norman can talk to you about right now. Hello, I'm Norman. I'm a geneticist and I work and I lead a team here at the Plant Breeding and Genetics Laboratory that mostly works on genomics. A plant is a product of its genome interacting with the environment it grows in. And it can only be as good as the underlying genes it carries. And plant breeding is a continuous process of recombining existing genetic variation into a new crop. In nature, in wild species, 
the, the process of evolution is constantly ongoing. There's random mutations filtered by the environment and natural selection, as Charles Darwin has coined it, uh, takes place all the time around us. And that's why all individuals of a species look fairly different. We have a different situ situation in our crops because millennia of domestication have unified the genomes and the genetic variation in most of our crops is very small. That's where mutation breeding comes in, where we mimic the process of natural evolution with a higher rate of mutation. We irradiate plants, inflict DNA changes, and then it's not nature that filters, but the breeder and the scientist filtering those plants to find the better ones for the next cycle of breeding. To do this, we have to select the plants, and we do this by looking at the plants themselves. We would look at their appearance, their chemical composition, and there we have new tools like multispectral imaging and all sorts of um, complicated um, chemical assays to, in high throughput mode, screen through hundreds of thousands of plants. At the same time, we look at their genomes to find out what these DNA changes are that we actually inflicted. And then all of this big data together we analyze with modern computer science, such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other approaches to link the genotype with the phenotype that we see and want, the new trait that the farmer ultimately requires and that um, adopts our plants to the, the changing environment. So this is all sophisticated science and requires a multidisciplinary team of scientists, which we have here at the PBGL, and let's go and meet some of them. Hi, I'm Susu. I'm an agricultural economist from Austria, and I'm also learning about plant breeding. Today, I'm extracting DNA from a coffee plant to do genomic analysis. Hi, I'm Adel from, uh, from Egypt. Um, today, I'm preparing uh, PCR for uh, uh, marker development. I'm chemist. Hi, I'm Manuel Morales from Puerto Rico. I'm a robotics engineer, and here I do data analysis for plant breeding. Hi, I'm Faith from Kenya. I'm a molecular biologist, currently working in vitro tissue culture, and I'm subculturing banana. Hi, I'm Samira from Iran. I studied plant breeding and genetics. Now I culture leaf disc to develop cell suspension culture. Thank you for listening. Please stay on for the Q&A se session that is following this. Cool stuff, and we're back. And we're joined now with those four colleagues you have seen on our videos. Um, do we see them? Yes. So I'll start. We've seen on the sterile insect technique two colleagues, Mark Friesen uh, from Belgium, who is the head of the insect pest control lab. Uh, and his favorite fly, his favorite insect, guess what, is the Sepse. So um, he's an entomologist. He's, he has 30 years in entomology. Uh, welcome, Mark. Good morning. Good morning. He's He's joining us in Cyberstorf in our labs outside Vienna, as well as Chantelle next to her, who joins us also from Cyberstorf. Uh, Chantelle de Bear is from South Africa. She's a research entomologist. Uh, I, I'm guessing your favorite insect is also the Setse. We've seen it very lively in the videos. Uh, you've joined us last year in March, but you have 15 years of entomology background. So welcome joining us as well. Thank you. And then we have our plant breeders, uh, Shobha Shivashankar from India. She is our head of the plant breeding and genetics section. Um, as I said, from, from India, she has uh, agronomy and plant biology experience for over 25 years. She joins us from the building where I sit in Vienna. But her colleague, Norman Bartmann, from Germany is joining us somewhere in a green field. No, that is also a cyber stuff. He's uh, working in our lab out there. 
Uh, Norman is from Germany. Uh, he, he's, he's been working on plant development and genomics for over 20 years. He joined us, the FAO IEA Joint Center, uh, three years ago. So, welcome all of you. We have uh, a good number of attendees listening to us. We've seen the videos, uh, and this is weird stuff you are involved in, really. Each time I go out there in your labs, I'm just amazed what you can do with uh, with radiation, with nuclear science, with everything. But the underlying thing for me is uh, how, how do all these things connect to nuclear science? So we need to get a bit deeper into this. Um, can I can I start with Shoba, please? Uh, you you said that irradiation brings mutations. Yeah, you force mutations. Do you force mutations on the crops, or how do you do that? And and related to that, what what is the connection to climate change? How do I get this connection? Thank you, Ihan. So normally mutations happen over a period of time. That is the process of evolution. So anything in the environment could be triggering mutations, and naturally that process happens over time. In plants, that leads to the evolution of newer uh, crop varieties, newer species. So with irradiation, what we do is that we um, hasten that process of genetic changes in the seed. And then that seed that is germinating would have an elevated or improved genetic potential for which we then select um, our traits of interest. And of course, the seed um, that carries the genetic change that has been irradiated and the plant is not radioactive. So um, it has then taken over multiple generations to select for the characteristic that we are looking for. You mentioned climate change. That is an important characteristic that we continuously select for. And how does climate change impact plants? Normally, when we talk about climate change, we talk about the actual change, the warming global temperatures, the weather phenomena that happens in the world, such as floods, droughts, all of that. But there's also a big impact of climate change on food security, because the plant's ability to perform under rising temperatures um, is compromised because uh, heat then affects the viability of pollen grains that fertilizes the uh, ovule to give rise to the seeds or the grains that we eat. So um, grains, fruits, vegetables, all of these are affected by heat. In addition, if drought happens and there is no moisture in the soil, then the crop is devastated. You cannot get the yield that the farmer is expecting. So that also requires genetic improvement in the crop. Flooding is another thing that has recently found a genetic change that could enable some of the crops to um, tolerate submerged conditions. So these are the various aspects of climate change that come into play and that affects farmers' income. And that is more, more and more uh, important for the food security of the developing world. In addition to what I mentioned, high heat temperatures and all of that and drought, uh, there's also warming temperatures that cause diseases and pests to move further north and towards the higher altitudes. And we see that in some of the major pests and diseases that are happening now. In the case of coffee, there is coffee rust that is affecting coffee plantations worldwide. There is the banana fusarium bolt that is um, that has been in Asia for a while, and then it is only in 2013 that it started moving to Africa, and then now it has been reported in Latin America. These are the, the, um, diseases like this impacts the farmer and the livelihoods of all of the people who are involved in that chain significantly. So genetic improvement is a major way of tackling this these effects of climate change. All and right. also for improved yields. Yeah. Shoba, uh, let's go quick so that we all uh, get to other questions too. But one thing, you've convinced me that the plant is not radioactive. You've convinced me that your work contributes to climate change tackling. But how 
do I accept that you are playing with the genes? What is the genetical modification there? I don't like genetically modified food. So what do I do, for example? So this is not genetically modified. The genetically modified organisms that we talk about in um, public conversations uh, is transgenic technology. And more recently, it is also gene editing. And some countries uh, consider gene editing not to be regulated, but most do not. They consider the, them as genomically, uh, genetically modified. But what does the transgenic what, mean? Can you just get to that? What is that? Gene editing? Transgenic. Trans, transgenic is when you take a gene from a different organism and put it in a new organism to give that a new trait. For example, Bt tolerant maize, where you take the Bacillus thuringiensis gene from the bacteria and put it in maize in order to make that maize um, resistant to insect attack. So that's transgenic. Uh, but uh, the uh, radiation or new, um, uh, mutation breeding technology has been used for more than 70 years, and a lot of our crops that we consume are um, um, modified in one form or other because of the evolutionary process of mutation, not by genetic transgenic mechanism. Even the Green Revolution um, earlier on in the 1960s, when famines were hitting, and we were trying to find improved rice and uh, wheat that came from spontaneous mutations in rice and wheat. And so this is the technology that we are using. So in, in, uh, in place of spontaneous mutations, we give irradiation so that those mutations become rapid and we can select from a larger pool. All right, good. Norman, over to you. We just received a question here. Thank you very much for your question from Stanford Pinto. My question is about how safe and edible are the radiation mutated plants for human consumption for being resilient to climate change. So do I get anything radiation left over from these plants when I consume them? No, <clears throat> so the, this is as as uh, Trova just explained, um, the radiation will simply. Induce mutations as other factors in the environment will do. And this is physical DNA damage that the plant hurries to repair and occasionally makes the one or the other mistake. So there's simple, small changes in the genome that the radiation causes, which are not any different from changes that environmental influence over um, the years would cause. So there is no concern whatsoever of the safety of this technology and the food we produce. Hmm. It's simply so that, so in nature, Imagine a large field of, 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 of grass where you have billions of plants where the evolutionary process happens at a rate of one mutation per generation. We can never look at so many plants to select our crops. So we are condensing this process into a, a number of plants we can actually handle and screen through. And for this, we increase the rate of mutation using the radiation, which is just increasing the rate, but not changing the nature of those changes. Okay, thank you. Now. Norman, how do you get to choose your crops? You know, Mark and Chantel are fans of Setsia flies. Are you a, are you a fan of, of sorghum or banana? Do you have a particular, how do you get to choose your plants? And who gets to tell you, okay, you now work on this plant? So that, that thank you for this question. It's important to note that uh, we are the member states laboratories. We don't do anything without a mandate by our member states. In this particular case, um, the, the IAEA has a so-called technical cooperation mechanism, and member states can apply to the IAEA TC and us for projects, and they already include the crop and the, the trade they favor. So, and from those projects, we then select, or actually we almost we implement almost all of these, um, and strictly work on whatever the member state, and together with the member state, whatever their demand wants. From those, I mean, we since we're getting so many applications for projects, obviously those TC projects, we have a pretty good idea of what the problems around the world are. And if we recognize patterns, if we see several countries from a region applying with similar crop and issue, then we are free to uh, launch bigger projects focused on R&D, so-called um, coordinated research projects where we then gather teams around the world, specialists on that topic. And within five years, we come up with uh, solutions that we then hopefully 
successfully kind of um, deploy through those technical cooperation mechanisms. So in summary, we do work only by member state mandate through direct interactions and applications by member states. And this is how I get to choose my crops. I mean, you see sorghum behind me, which is a photo from last Friday from our field. Um, we obviously have the limitation that in Vienna, we can't grow any crop outside, but we have succeeded for most of those. And uh, we don't need necessarily have to grow them here because we have a network all over the globe with people uh, where we can grow the crops if we need to. All right, before we switch to the insects, can I hear some very concrete crops that have been released for further cultivation that have that are showing totally new characteristics that didn't exist before. Sorghum is one you are standing well, behind. There is obviously, Shoba mentioned earlier the, the green revolution genes, right? The green revolution was um, simple. Uh, the, the start of the green revolution came about by a simple trait, which was semi-dwarfism. You can imagine that a crop that you start fertilizing will grow and grow and grow and then eventually become too tall and, and fall over. So the, the, the key of the green revolution in the 60s was to have, have crops that actually stayed small and so wind and, and, and rain couldn't damage them too strongly. And that's obviously a trait that we've been transferring through mutation breeding into other um, into other crops, for example, sorghum. Then disease resistance. You have to imagine that a disease um, and the resistance to a disease or the susceptibility is a, is a, is a communication uh, between the pathogen and the plant. And disturbing that, that, that communication through mutation is obviously an easy target for us. And uh, obviously, we had a, last week we had a big celebration of a, a new cotton variety that that was that's now been released a couple of years ago in Pakistan. Cotton, and, yes, cotton, and that is that is very very successful. Mostly, it's so we are helping the member states to release the crop, so to produce the crop, but then it, ultimately the the release is in the member state by um, the normal crop release mechanisms. You have to prove that your crop is better than, than what existed previously. And that's what these member states do by themselves. So we are just assisting in this process. All right, thank well, you. If, if I may, Ihan. So um, there are more than 3000 varieties released from mutation breeding that are cultivated. Can we the number again, please? Uh, 3,365 that is recorded in the database, but this is not the entire. New varieties of crops, three, of over 3,000. Mutant varieties that are cultivated all through the glo globe. And these include a large number of food crops, including rice that is released through mutation breeding. The largest mutation breeding varieties that are across the globe is from China. And they use a variety of mutation breeding technologies, including radiation by gamma rays, but also space breeding, where they send seeds to the space by space satellite and use that seed from selection. Um, and the largest, um, the second largest variety of wheat that is cultivated in China now is from space breeding. Uh, the second, the next uh, country is Japan that has a lot of mutant breeding, mutant varieties uh, cultivated. And then the third is India, but it's all over the globe. And uh, those in, um, in, in the US and in Texas would know the star ruby, the grapefruit, that is one of the grapefruit uh, varieties that have been released a long time back from mutation breeding. So there are varieties across, across the globe. All right, thank you. We will probably get back to you with questions. Now let's switch to our uh, other friends, the insects, the, the, the tsetses and, and others. Now, Mark, we've, we've seen the, the video that was really Quite interesting, and you said there what what I picked there was that the sterile insect technique using radiation to sterilize the male flies was environmentally friendly. How is that? Why is that? Because you know uh, it is environment friendly because the only thing that you're doing is releasing you know male insects into a target area that cannot uh, propagate. The only thing that they can do is uh, you know seek out the virgin females. Uh, they mate, and then you know after a while they will then eventually uh, die. Don't forget that they are uh, irradiated, so their lifespan is not is not that long. So you're actually uh, not uh, intriguing about uh, upon anything, you know, in 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 nature or the environment. 
I'm trying to understand what do you have against the males? Why not the females? Why do you only sterilize the males? Well, if you uh, think about it, you know, uh, basically you only need uh, the males. Uh, they have the advantage that they can mate, uh, you know, several uh, times. So they have the opportunity to uh, fertilize several uh, or inseminate several uh, uh, wild females. Whereas if you're releasing, uh, you know, uh, sterile females, what can they do? You know, uh, very often they will mate with the sterile males if they're released together. So uh, actually it's a waste of, of, of sterile sperm. And even if the sterile uh, females uh, is mating with uh, a wild male, there is no impact. So the only impact that you see is when the males are being sterilized, released, and they can then mate with the virgin wild females, making those wild females uh, sterile. I see. And uh, what animals do you choose? Can you use this on any insects you would wish to? No, uh, certainly not. And we get uh, many, many requests from uh, people in member states uh, stating that they have a problem with this insect or that insect. But you have to realize that the phase uh, of the insect that you are releasing should not uh, add to the damage. You know, uh, we have, for instance, uh, fruit flies here uh, in, in, in the lab, and it is the larvae of the fruit flies that is causing the damage to the fruit. You know, we are releasing the adult males and these adult males, they uh, are harmless to the crop. So it's very important to realize that the insect that you are releasing, you know, should not contribute to the problem. Uh, another example is, for instance, mosquitoes. Uh, it's the male mosquitoes that we are releasing and male mosquitoes are not biting them, the, the, the people. They are not uh, uh, transmitting uh, the disease. It's only the females. So if you're only releasing the males, you do not contribute to the problem. So that is a very, very important principle if you would like to use the, uh, the sterile insect technique. I see. And why is this method anyway better than the conventional methods of fighting the insects, insect pests? Well, <clears throat> as I said in the video, uh, I don't necessarily think that the technology is, 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 is better, but it is very, very environment friendly. If we see that, you know, uh, the most common way of uh, dealing with insect pests is by spraying insecticides, you know, and this is this, this is very, very bad uh, to the environment. So the big advantage of the sterile insect technique is that it uh, is uh, environment friendly. It is neutral to the environment and it does not cause uh, any, any harm. I see. Thank you. Chantel, I have a question. You've come from Africa. South Africa, but the continent where the tsetse fly is the one of the main issues for for cattle breeding and livelihood. Uh, what is the connection of this sterile insect technique really to today's theme, World Food Forum? H how do you, how do we get this? Is it is it just the cattle, or is it others as well? So uh, the tsetse are vectors of the disease. So this actually means that uh, a cattle will get, get sick uh, with the disease, which is called Nagana for cattle. Uh, it's a blood parasite, so it will be inside the blood of the, of, of the cattle. The tsetse will then come, uh, it will feed from the blood of the cattle, and then it will become infected itself with this parasite, and then it will be able to transmit it to another cattle. So the tsetse acts as the vector that transmits the disease from one individual to the next, to the next, to the next. So when a cattle is infected with, with Nangana, um, it, is, it is sick and it cannot uh, pick up weight. Uh, it cannot produce um, a lot of milk. It has problems with producing offspring, uh, but it's also, it, it, it can't be used for, for plowing your field. So, you know, in Africa, uh, many of these farmers are subsistence farmers and they don't, don't use uh, tractors or anything like that. They use the animals to, to work their field. And if the animal is sick with Nangana, it's difficult for the animal to, to be used for working their field. So the disease does not only impact the meat production or the milk production, but it also can impact the farmer's ability to work their, their field to plant things like maize and, and vegetables and, and, and other things like this. I see. One technical question to you, uh, Chantel, are those uh, lovely insects we've seen with the dots on their back, are they radioactive? No, they're not. So uh, when we put them inside the radiator and we uh, ra radiate them out, uh, the dose that we give them is not sufficiently enough to keep the, to, to make them radioactive and they're not. We are just changing, we are just also inducing a mutation inside them, inside the sperm of the males to make them sterile. 
Um, so even if we release the males from the, in the field, they are not really active and they cannot, uh, you have not changed anything in, inside the male except their ability to, to have active sperm or sperm that are, is fertile. Um, very quickly, can we hear a few concrete examples of where sterile insect technique is currently used against which animals, against which insects? Um, so currently we are using it for tsetse flies. They are currently used in Senegal uh, to control their diseases in Senegal. Um, for fruit flies, there is a, a large facility in, in, um, in Guatemala that produce fruit flies. And this is uh, used in many, many countries uh, around the world. We also use them in um, uh, mosquito control uh, for a wide range of, of diseases like um, uh, malaria. Uh, so, Mark, if you don't know if you want to add anything here. Well, don't forget the uh, there are a few big programs against uh, moths. You know, there is uh, a program in, in Canada against the calling moth that has been going on for more than 25 years. And that has resulted in, in a valley that is basically insecticide free. Uh, and we also have a very, very nice uh, program uh, against the false calling moth in, in, in South Africa. Uh, it's actually a, a privatized uh, company, you know, a private company who is uh, implementing this, um, this this program, and it, it's it's working really, really well. Right. Uh, Margarita was asking if we can use the sterile insect technique against any insect. Well, as I said, you know, we you can only use it against those insects uh, whereby the phase that you are releasing is not contributing to the damage. We have been asked uh, on several occasions to, uh, you know, develop the technology for desert locusts, for instance. And uh, you know, it, the desert locusts, it's the, you know, it's it's the, uh, you know, it eats the crops. So can you imagine what would happen if, you know, with the hundreds of millions that are out there, you add a few hundreds of millions, you know, you would, you know, make the the, the problem worse. So it is only suitable for those insects whereby the phase that you are releasing is not, the development phase that you're releasing is not adding, contributing to the problem. Right. Just to add to Mark's comment, uh, from a technical side of, of, of point of view, uh, you should also be able to know the life cycle of the insect very well. So these insects need to be able to be reared. So you need to bring them inside to the laboratory. You will need to be able to feed the adults and let the adults mate and let the adults be able to be, to uh, produce. So not just uh, release it, uh, that their the offspring or the, the, the organism that you're releasing doesn't uh, damage your crop, but also that you can technically rear them in large quantities in the laboratory. Yes, and in most, Thank cases, you, you, and in most cases, you would need an artificial diet, you know, to, 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 to produce them. And for many, many uh, insects, these artificial diets have not been uh, developed yet. So this is, as Chantel uh, points out, this is a very significant issue. Thank you. Uh, just before we move on back to the plant breeding, uh, Nicola asks, can we use the SIT also for the New World Screwworm endemic in South America? Well, the New World Screwworm is, uh, you know, the cell insect technique was actually uh, developed, you know, uh, first for the New World uh, Screwworm. You know, it was a problem in the US in the beginning of the last uh, century. Every summer you saw that screwworm was invading the southern part of the US and it was moving up uh, north. And, you know, basically they could not uh, keep the insect uh, under control until, you know, this uh, brilliant um, entomologist came up with this idea, why not, uh, you know, not to, to try to kill the, the, the insect, but let's uh, see if we can introduce sterility in the population and see, you know, how we can then uh, control it and, you know, uh, it, it, it worked. They only had to wait until the 1950s to find a way to sterilize the insect using X-rays or, or, or gamma rays. And, uh, you know, uh, the New World screw was eradicated from the United States. It was eradicated from the whole of uh, Central uh, America up uh, down to, 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 to Panama. And uh, this huge area has been uh, screwworm free, you know, for the last uh, 20 years. Thank you. Sorry, one more question came in that I also would love to ask this. Uh, Chantel, how did how did you mark those flies with those different colors? We've <laughs> seen it in the video. I just didn't get catch that one. There, there is two ways that you can do it. I just painted the little dot uh, of paint on the, the, the fly. So I, I, if you make it cool in the room, they stand still and you can just dot a little uh, 
piece of paint on the on the thorax and you can mark them like this or of course you can they are when they are in the pupa phase you can put uh, dust around the pupa and when they emerge out of the pupa shell they will also get uh, coated with this uh, color dust um, and then you can mark them in this way as well and this is so, how we so that's only for the experimental environment it's not for a real field application no, for field application you will use the dust over the, the shells and this is how what they do when uh, every time uh, sterile males are released in the field they are colored so that we know which ones were the sterile compared to the field flies and when we collect individuals back we can see uh, how many of the individuals that we collected were from the sterile flies that we've released or they were from the wild individuals in the field Thank you. Now, we have 15 minutes left. I'm going to go back to Shoba. We have a question from Esther who says, the technique, the radiation that you use affect, how, how does it affect the quality, the nutritional value and the decomposition process of the crops? So, radiation and mutation breeding can be used for any trait, including improving quality. The process of irradiation of the seed itself is not going to be affecting the quality of the produce that comes from the crop eventually. So, if that is the, um, you know, the, that is behind the question, then it does not affect the quality in that way. The radiation produces, and the radiation is on the seed, and then the seed grows out to a plant. And that plant goes through multiple generations to give the seed that then goes to the farmer for cultivation. There is nothing that affects the quality in that manner. However, just like we affect or improve the ability of the plant to increase yields or produce better iron and zinc in the grain, all of that can be improved through irradiation and mutation breeding by affecting the genetic change in the, uh, in the plant. And we've seen, I mean, I remember from my reading some examples of um, a new barley variety that grows high up in the Peruvian Andes in 3,500 meters where it would normally not grow. Is that right? Yes, yes. Um, the barley uh, mutation breeding program has been very significant in, uh, in Peru at the UNALM and uh, they have bred varieties normally in the highlands of the Andes. Um, it is very adverse conditions for uh, crop cultivation. So very few crops survive there. And these crops are already attuned to the harsh environments. For example, barley, quinoa, amaranth, all of those. But to make them better growing under these conditions, mutation breeding can be used. And the centenary variety of barley has been bred to be much um, significantly improved than the existing varieties. And I think it covers about 17% of the barley area that is cultivated in Peru. That is the total barley area in the country. That's a, that's a huge amount. Thank yeah. you for that. Um, now, we have a question on, uh, you mentioned earlier, space breeding. How, how is that working? What is the success rate? And is, is it more advantageous than, than the gamma breeding? That at present, I'm sorry, before you go, what is space breeding? What are we doing here? Okay, space breeding is using cosmic radiation to create the mutations. So, the further that we are out in space, the higher the cosmic radiation. And so, that is um, similar to gamma radiation, but we are sending the seed to the space. Now, at this point, the research is very, very minimal. So, we cannot really say how the comparison happens between space breeding and gamma breeding, except in uh, China, but they have not done in-depth uh, in investigations. But China is the single country that has been using space irradiation for developing varieties. And uh, since um, over the last one and a half decades, they have more than 70 varieties that have been released just from space breeding. And they had a satellite that went out to space in 2006 that was completely dedicated for plants. And 2000 sets of different varieties of, of seeds were in that satellite. So they're using that material to breed for newer crops. So that is what's happening in, um, in China. Now, at this point, we are at the IAEA, at the joint FAO IAEA Center. We are planning to um, and inquire, explore space breeding by 
just starting a feasibility study to send some seeds to the International Space Station. And that is part of a new coordinated research project that will happen, that will start next year, early next year. Um, in addition to actually sending seeds to space, China also has simulated cosmic um, radiators. And again, I'm not fully sure how they work, but there is a new facility called the Star Labs that is um, that has established in the UAE, which is also looking for uh, simulating space radiation. Um, the interest more recently in space breeding has been ex um, extreme when um, recently there were about 300 cuttings of grapevine that was sent by uh, the French scientists to the ISS, to the International Space Station. And they were brought back down very, very recently. And they're looking at the genetic changes of these grapevines. And again, uh, the main focus is to be identifying material, genetic material that would survive harsh, adverse conditions of growth. Mm. Okay, we don't have much time left. I'm going to come back uh, to all of you about your careers, but I want to ask a question to Mark. Um, is the SIT, uh, you know, sterilized and sterilized through radiation, those insects, are, are they stressed? Do they show any uh, strange behavior? Does it affect their life, lifestyle, lifeline when they're released back to the nature? Well, yes, of course, you have to realize that, you know, uh, we do a lot of nasty things to these insects. You know, we put them, you know, uh, in, in, in large uh, volumes in, 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 in small cages. You know, we irradiate them with a very, very high dose of irradiation. You know, the irradiation for Tsetse revolves around 100, 120 gray. If I give you uh, that uh, radiation dose, you know, you will be dead in, in, in two weeks from now. So obviously, you know, we throw these insects, uh, you know, into the target area, usually from a plane. So uh, obviously, you know, the quality of the insect is reduced uh, if you compare it to uh, the quality of the wild insect. And therefore, uh, you know, the, the, the idea is to outnumber, you know, the sterile ones compared to the wild ones. And we are talking of ratios uh, 10 to 1 uh, up to uh, 100 to 1. 100 sterols for, for, for one wild, so that the probability of mating with, you know, a, a wild female is, is higher for the sterols than it is for the wild ones. So, yes, there is a quality uh, reducing element that has to be taken into account. And this is what you have seen in the video that, uh, you know, we are using these uh, cages, these field cages to simulate a natural environment and to see whether uh, the behavior of the insect is has not uh, changed uh you know by the things that we have done to them thank you thank you now this topic is amazing both of your areas but we have seven minutes left at this world food forum live chat on on nuclear science for for world food programs um now i want to get back to a very generic question how did you get here where you are and what would you tell our young audience because this is a cross sectional cross cultural environment that you work on you work with statisticians you work with computer scientists there is artificial intelligence involved there is plant breeding i mean molecular biology in both animals and in plants but if i'm interested how do i get to where you are let's start with norman hi i'm i'm pretty excited to to share um so I, I think I was constantly looking throughout my school time and, and undergrad, I was constantly looking for a place to, to contribute. It's not like the environmental issues and social issues of this world are new. Back in the 90s, that was also the young people were, were outraged by the slow progress we were making. So I was then choosing a, a career in nat natural sciences. And I think biology was for me the, 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 the one to go. And then from there, I did an academic career, a normal one. And uh, ended well. Now I'm now here since 2018 at the IAA FAO Joint uh, Center, um, and finally found a place where I can really contribute to um, the betterment of the world. And if I want to give some advice, um, just do what you love, and think for where you can make your contribution. Great, thank you, uh, Shoba. 
Well, I was born in India and India is an agricultural country and I've seen um, the struggles of farmers and that is one area that I wanted to work on. And my career has taken me through high-end science um, in the industry and also the international agriculture in, uh, uh, in subsistence farming conditions. And combined with uh, traditional uh, plant breeding and the newer high-end technologies, it's an exciting place and time at this point to contribute significantly to world's food security. And that's, that keeps me going. Thank you. In between, I can just say at the IAEA, we've mapped out the sustainable development goals, and we are proud to say that we actually directly contribute to nine out of the 17 sustainable development goals, if not indirectly to all the others. And so the work you're doing in both those labs contribute directly to several of them. So, uh, Mark, what brought you here and what would you tell our young audience how to how to get there? Well, it's, it's, in, my, in my case, you know, uh, when I was young, uh, I was fascinated by uh, two things. I was fascinated by insects, entomology, and I was fascinated by Africa. It had an, a real uh, attractive uh, power uh, on me. And then if you put one and one together, you know, you'll very, very quickly come to tsetse flies because they are, you know, the root cause of, uh, or one of the root causes of, of hunger and poverty uh, in, in, in Africa. And when I got the opportunity, you know, 30 years ago to uh, come to Zyberzorf and start as a young, you know, JPO uh, in, in, in the lab here, you know, it was an opportunity that I, I grabbed and uh, I worked very, very hard. And, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, probably one of the reasons why I am where I am. Uh, my advice to young people is uh, similar to what Norman is saying, you know, uh, follow your your gut feeling and, and, and work very, very hard. Thank you. Chantel? I think the most important thing in life is to find the place where you fit. So find the thing that, that fascinates you and that gives you wonder and see how you can take that, uh, that thing that you find wonderful and see how you can use it to make a difference in this world. And the same with me, uh, and I have the same message than everybody else in this panel. Um, as a young, young person, I, I was fascinated by insects, and this is the place that I found that I could work that doesn't feel like work. I'm playing with insects every day, and this is very fascinating to me. And, and then um, in, in a, in a, when I was young, before I started my PhD, um, I, I got exposed to the IA and they really assisted me in, in taking this passion that I have and developing in such a way that it can be useful and that I can use it um, in, the, in the environment in Africa where I was based. So also my, my, my advice is to find the thing that you are passionate about and work really hard to use this to make a difference in the world. Thank you. Now, uh, to wrap up, it's, it's, it's been wonderful. Thank you for this live chat. Um, allow me to tell our audience yes. that we're not just the entomologists you see on screen and the plant breeders, the molecular biologists you see on screen. We are a truly cross-sectional um, professional bunch of people that we include uh, computer scientists, we include radiation specialists. We we have different, very different, diverse walks of life here, and we offer uh, very interesting internship programs. Mark mentioned a, an acronym called JPO. It's a junior professional officer. Basically, the countries send their young, promising people as uh, future uh, leaders to to come and join us. We have fellows in the laboratories that our colleagues work. Uh, we have we've proudly trained and benefited from, and they benefit from us. Uh, thousands of fellows so far from developing countries that have stayed a few months to a year or longer even at cyber at our cyber stuff research laboratories. So all of these background and what can you do and how can you get involved with us? You can find on our website iaea.org or even the Joint Center, the FAO IAEA Joint Center for Food and Agriculture. Thank you very much, all of you, Norman, Shoba, Mark, Chantel, our audience. 
we love, we appreciate that you've dedicated your one hour to us today. Uh, we will reach the sustainable development goals together and with nuclear science helping you. Thank you and greetings from Vienna. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.